more known. The Dark Eldar have always been kind of a, a love-hate relationship with me in that the concept art and the illustrations in the various army book publications has captured, always captured my imagination. But the miniatures were always left with an outline that I wasn't really desired to paint. Uh, with the more recent miniature releases from this line, things are starting to look a lot more promising and upcoming. And now with the brand new Mandrakes, things are really looking up on these sculpts. With a nice touch of inspiration drawing from like Japanese cloth of the skirt and the rope details, more defined musculature, flowing hair, and in general, a much cleaner sculpt to paint on these new plastic builds. This was the perfect nightmare to set my brush on and of course to bring alive. In this process of painting, I would like to highlight a few key ideas to take away from this tutorial besides the obvious color recipe. First is the workflow and my initial approach. First off, I didn't spend a lot of time or actually any prior to painting to think about inspiration or really grab references and color swatches for this piece. Where for other paintings, I like to take that approach, but there are times where I want to enjoy painting off the cuff and test what I'm feeling, you know, right at the moment. Therefore, I'll only paint the front of the miniature as this brings me the final look of the piece faster. Nailing a painting scheme in this way also ensures you're not wasting possible time on the back to only make changes and to go over things entirely. This is actually my approach to all coming up with uh, all painting schemes, especially when I don't know when I'm not using any references and creating something from my own imagination. If only painting the front size of the miniature intimidates you when it comes to painting the back, Really just thinking about it in terms of each miniature is actually two paintings on a single canvas, as it's impossible to see all sides of the model at once. So as we as a viewer, we'll only look at it from either the front and then take a look at it in the back. Second is the position of light. To give this miniature some drama, I like to position the lights in a few key areas that I find the most interesting. The main thing is, is that I don't connect these focal points together allowing each point, to decay, each point of light to decay as further away the object gets from the initial center of the light. The main light, light points are the sides of the skirt on the upper leg and the hip, the top of the head, and of course his flaming hand. As you can see that this is where the point of light goes brightest by both value of how light or how dark something is, as well as the size of the highlights as a whole it's true that our max highlights can be placed very small scattered around high points and edges, for instance. But what you will notice that the three main areas above have the largest concentration of this value around, giving us the location of the focus. For each mandrake in the squad, I'll, it'll be your artistic creativity to come up with some focal points you find interesting. Just for a miniature of this size, be selective. I like to think of areas on the model in a hierarchy, placing the most important two to three things at the very top and everything else is actually in support. The nice thing is that all these models have fire coming from the hands and they also have a head. So you're already given two key focal points. Finding a third and I think you can't go too far. Some, you know, you might want to be emphasis on the blade or the weapon he's holding, while others possibly the tattoos maybe the eyes, or, you know, some other detail that you like. I've simply picked the skirt because I love the design, and which brings me to the third key idea, the color. Much like selecting a few key elements to bring attention to, I will also do this with the, color, uh, with the colors to do my best to keep the clothes color palette possible. I really wanted to work with this color from Chimera called Samurai Green, and... No kidding, since the little bit of inspiration is right directly from the clothes. And to darken this with some Misfits greens from Scale 75 Fantasy range. I then looked to see what the contrast this against and decided to do a split complementary and include the other major elements of the fire with orange and red. It's the play on these two colors which will set the tone and see how they'll interact. The other elements, such as the skin and hair, are all desaturated and no stronger pure colors will be used on those or anything else. Skin tone, such as Kizla Flesh, is just essentially orange desaturated, as well as to help unify the piece as a whole, I'll have the green, the darker green, to be the base tone for all the elements other than the fire, 
and I'll be grabbing sunny skin tone to add in pinches to all my highlights throughout every element, bringing the composition just a little bit closer together. If you want a cool uh, web tool to play around with to explore color schemes, I suggest using Adobe Color Online. You can set various color schemes to experiment with, and the eyedropper tool is excellent that you can sample an image on your screen, whether it be your own work or others out there, you know, to just check out what your favorite paintings include or illustrations. The possibilities are really endless. Okay, with those points laid out, I think it's take time to get our paints and palettes ready, and let's get started. All right, so with the palette here is we have that puddle of misfits green on the palette and right there I'm mixing into there is just a bit of samurai green. The entire model was airbrushed um, misfits green from scale 75 um, fantasy game range. Um, the airbrush is just, you know, to speed things up um, and it just gives a very nice even base coat to start. Um, you don't have to, of course, so you can just do that by brush and it shouldn't be too hard. That paint is uh, a little bit satin and it, it goes on, it covers out pretty well. With this mixture here, all I'm doing is I'm painting the cloth and of course starting where the main light is. In a general rule of thumb is anytime I'm painting highlights, I like to always start at the brightest point. It gives me somewhere to aim, keeps me um, focused on where I want to be placing my light source and you know even if the color is not totally correct um, it's right at a point where you know you're gonna go over multiple times going brighter and brighter so you know if you go too bright that's fine or if you don't go bright enough well you're gonna paint on top of it anyway um, and it just keeps you aligned so you're always focused where this uh, this point of lights going through and it doesn't you know being less lost in a painting is always a nice thing so with the light folding on the on hit the model's hip, all the folds, the main highlights, the majority of our highlights are going to be on the right side of each of these folds, just so they're facing more towards the light. That doesn't mean for the first few stages like I'm going to be doing here, you know, there are going to be some building up of lights on the left side, but nothing too far. And I'll tell you when we are going to kind of stop painting on the left side of each of these folds. Hey, I just want to slot in a quick message that I'm also on Patreon. If you come out learning anything new and enjoyed this tutorial, consider joining me on Patreon. Being a supporter, you'll have access to over 100 hours of video tutorials ranging from multi-part video model series, as well as my foundation series where we focus on essential painting methods which make up the more complex painting techniques and effects. Patreon subscribers will also be invited to join us on Discord, where we can connect and share your works with other members who are like-minded in the pursuit of per improving your miniature painting. Alright, I did the little YouTube plug. Let's get right back into the painting. And here we go. See, I'm still placing lights. The other thing is I'm also doing a little bit of highlighting in the inner edge. So to get a little more volume into our work, I don't want to just pit them in complete shadow. Even though it is a recess in the fold, um, we do have a little bit of light that just gets into there. And it also just helps create a little more, um, a little more shape within our, our cloth so we can really see the, uh, uh, just the shape of it, which is really nice. All in all, it's always separated by another shadow. So on each of those folded planes, you'll see a highlight goes into shadow and then just a little bit of highlight right at the crease on the inner edge. And that's just due to actually if our light is appearing straight down in the center, even though it's in a recess, if it's visible to our primary light, it's going to get a little bit of a highlight. But also, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have to be, I guess, a good quote that I always like to hear or my buddy Raf used to, uh, says that realism is one thing, but Realism is kind of boring, so the more better term to use it is just make it believable. You know, sometimes some artistic uh, uh, interpretation is always there. So I find this little bit of illustration trick just to show a little bit more of the volumes, a little more interesting.
Now for the second stage highlight, we're just going to be highlighting and just adding a little more samurai green into the mix. Throughout this painting, you're going to be seeing a lot of layering. That is the main um, that is the main method that I'll be using for the majority of this painting. If you ever go too high in a value and it jumps out and uh, you know just creates a bit of a, a, a harder transition, you can always either try to bridge blend those two areas together just by mixing on the palette a value that's in between the two and just try to do your best and slice it in as an intermediate bridge to bridge the two values that are coming together. But otherwise, the paint consistency that we're using on the palette, where I mostly like to do, is around a third to a half, like one part water to one part paint, or more on the lines of like maybe uh, 40 to 60. So 40%, 40% water, 60% paint. This allows me to keep the paint flowing a little bit smoother and it also just allows the mark on the the mark that the paint leaves is going to be a bit softer. And depending on what kind of brush you're using, um, this ratio can change. So, you know, I say the ratios as a rough guide, but really it's also about how much charge you have, how much paint you're picking up in your brush, that's what charge is, and um, the size of brush that you're using. In this example, I am using a size one of the, the new arrow brush from Camara. Now it's got an interesting tip. Don't focus on that. Um, but the main thing is about the size of the brush itself. So like a size one or anything larger has got more bristles. Therefore it retains more moisture in the brush. So every time you go to rinse and you dry your brush, it's going to hold a little bit more water than let's say a double zero from uh, from Artis Opus, which is my other favorite detailing brush. So that in a sense, even with your your diluted paint on the palette, with a larger brush, it'll dilute the paint a little bit more and it's diluting it within the bristles itself. So keep that in mind when you're trying to find the right consistency. Otherwise, a lot of my brush strokes when I'm focusing, when I'm building these volumes up here is pay attention to the direction of the brush strokes I'm using. I'm either going to be using a, a series of small stipples or like, like little, um, little patches of paint at a time to build up, but any sweeping brush mo stroke motions that are on the, vo on the volumes themselves, commonly I'm always brushing in the direction of the highlight that I'm working with. This just ensures is that the very end of each stroke that you're using there's always going to be a little bit extra paint that de gets deposited at the end of your stroke um, on, a, on a normal brush stroke that you're using and we want that little bit of extra pigment to sit at the uh, the strongest point in your highlight or the strongest amount of color so since we're painting highlights we're always pushing our paint strokes generally towards the highlight or at least manipulating the puddle little puddle of paint that you and um when you are uh, when you're depositing paint onto the model there's always a period in acrylic timing when there's you know the paint is still wet and we can still move it around a little bit and soon after it'll start to dry so you have like a short like this little little short working window if you need to maneuver anything possible but keep that in mind when i'm using my brushwork even here even on an edge highlight to just get a little bit of irregularity and a little more um, looser formation. I won't just run the brush like a sharp, sharp edge highlight, um, especially when it comes to fabrics. You know, I wanted to have the fabric just a bit softer, not a lot. Um, and you still want to show that, you know, that that uh, the, the folds within the cloth, I think, are really, really cool and they should stick out. But I don't want to be, you know, I don't need to be surgical and treat it like metal. And also, this model is for the tabletop, you know, <laughs> um, it's not going to be uh, developed quite into like, you know, a, a higher end display piece or like for competition or anything like that. So um, I find with these, uh, this mixture of paint strokes, you know, really paying attention to the brush direction that I'm using and keeping a, just a little bit loose just helps. Um, you know get through the the work a little bit quicker but you know still helps to convey the vibe that you really want to set for the model 
again you can see little little dabs and the nice thing is about those little dabs especially as we move her this area of the um, the skirt is pretty far away from our primary light source so the highlights there get even smaller and that's what like you know that's why I think like helps um, set the drama to this piece you know not treating the entire skirt evenly throughout and just giving emphasis and weight on one side You can see again placing some <laughs> highlights at the uh, the opposite it's like the opposite of edge highlighting inverted edge highlighting just putting a little bit of light in there just to show it's not like a complete void um, depending on the mood of the miniature and how you want to light it you know that could be changed you know you you could just leave those in darkness and then you know you'd get a very different vibe to the model but here i, I really like the green i don't want to just like leave almost all of it in shadow so just bringing a little bit more light in on those uh, edges where the folds are i think kind of um, helps build those out the outwards edges will always be brighter anyway i won't go as bright in the inward edges but you know giving them a little bit is always nice here in the the palette you can see the mixture i don't go to pure samurai green because i don't want to get to that much of a pure color so before we get to the pure samurai green that's where i start adding um, a little bit of that white in the highlight and of course like uh another thing is when you're adding white into your highlights you know essentially you are even though you're raising the value of the of the color you are in a sense desaturating it more so you're pulling out a little bit of color out of the out of the piece just to you know it's more like just to be aware of that you'll see later um, I start adding some sunny skin tone into a, a lot more areas and that is using it as a since it's a high value color in the first place um, it's also to highlight but to, to keep more color in the piece so it's not completely desaturated but at this stage here especially when I start adding this brighter highlight now you can start to see the uh, uh, the um, the area getting <laughs> getting brighter and you can see where I've aimed the highlight so right that 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 block part on the uh, on that that section there that is the main uh, that that's a, that's where the main key light is on this on this cloth and you can see that instead of just doing like completely smooth gradients i'm doing little little stipples but they're spaced apart now this is just an easy uh, an easy like shading or like you know um, blending technique without actually like you know mixing the paints together but by putting little dots and leaving tiny little spaces in between them to have the previous layer show, we get the effect of it being a gradient transition. It's not the most smoothest, it's not like a, you know, a perfect gradient, but that's not what we're aiming for. And it also think it, I think it's also a good technique because, you know, it gets a, a little bit of character in there as well as, you know, again, we're painting cloth and, um, you know, I want to show a little bit of irregularities i want to get a, a more of a feel for it i think the coolest thing with textures is it's something that you feel just through your eyes right we're not like we're not making the actual surface rough or feel like cloth because if you touch the model it feel like I don't know, plastic <laughs> right but with our eyes you know that's that's the effect that we want to get and i think it's very effective and then pair it off with the um the next technique that we use to uh, bring that a little bit more together um, is a great combination and um, you know I use it on many different projects to you know uh, get those highlights through and if you can maybe just you know, take a guess <laughs> what do you think is coming up I think um, I do that even when I'm studying other people's work or and um, when I'm studying other paintings is trying to come up with uh you know theories on oh what did he do what did uh what did how did this painter achieve this effect i think we all kind of do it but uh you know i like to keep an active idea 
on how various uh, techniques and effects are, are created. And I encourage you guys to do that while you're watching this. So you can notice here, especially the highlights, much smaller, little, little, like little stipples, trying to keep like, you know, a little bit of those highlights uneven. It also goes to show that if you were to like just edge highlight everything, think of that as the highlight that's making the highlight bigger because you're drawing one continuous line, the, lar the surface area of your highlights are getting larger and they become stronger. So in order to really emphasize and help out that main primary highlight, the central point that I pointed out on the hip to keep that even more in check, all these other highlights that we're highlighting with, even though they're the same value, they're a lot smaller and in areas where I need a little group of them, I would rather stipple them in and leave like various little small distances in between just to show that they're not as strong as the main highlight. As you notice, like the main highlight is completely filled. So again, giving more strength to that highlight in comparison to these a uh, lot smaller and uh, weaker secondary lights or um, other other highlights that are coming through but you can see how they're lowering in decay as they get further and further away from the main light. Wow that was a mouthful. <laughs> Hope you got all of that. Another good thing to note here as well is, and throughout the piece, not and not just this one, is like all your pieces, like really just um, helping to develop your brush pressure, which is I think one of the most slept on or maybe hidden features of uh, how, how to improve your painting. Um, I have a, a general saying is I'm always trying to tickle the model as much as I can and what I mean by tickling is like you know you want to touch it as softly as possible and especially you know starting off or maybe you're not completely aware of this is that's what's really good to control how much pigment is going to be uh, deposited how big um, each mark is going to be and the more you can uh, the better you get at finessing this the better you're going to get here now I've just introduced on the palette, sorry to interrupt, is Sunny Skin Tone. So you saw me add a little bit of white into the first highlight. Now I'm adding a little bit of white with Sunny Skin Tone. So here um, I'm playing with a little bit of temperature. So that's the thing is, you know, green is generally a cooler color. So to make our highlights more prominent and gain a little more contrast, I'm going to play the temperature game and add in a warmer highlight color into my mix to, uh, you know, further get more contrast in the work. The other advantages of this, if you're thinking about it, is if I just keep adding white, yes, it goes higher up in value, but you will find out that you're going to run out of headroom really, really quick. And two, the most, <laughs> probably the most, the brightest thing that should be on this part of the model is his hand. So, and the last thing I want to do is have his skirt or his hip totally compete with his hand. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's another thing. But otherwise I find, especially like playing with a little bit of temperature, it helps relieve, it, it puts some of the emphasis, not just purely on value and just utilizing, um, utilizing another uh, tool in our toolbox to help us find contrast. And also, at the very least, it also keeps a little bit more color in the work. Um, like I said earlier, when you're starting, if you're just highlighting with white, yeah, you're building the value up higher, but you're actually desaturating the area because white isn't a color. It just starts turning white. <laughs> so by highlighting with lighter colors or like pastel colors and then also trying to find a little bit of contrast with temperature so you know right now green again it's cold finding a warmer highlight to highlight it with and vice versa if this was like a red skirt maybe uh in the highlights maybe you could add a little bit of like uh, pastel blue 
or maybe a bit of pastel green. You know, that, that'd be quite interesting. You never know. You, you take a look and see what happens. Um, I think that's part of the fun with colors. You know, you can just experiment with, uh, you know, different techniques and see the results. And I think a, a lot of them would be quite pleasing and you might find a unique uh, color recipe that's like, you know, something you really like and it kind of be maybe a signature or, you know, just something different than just doing, going up, doing the value scale, going, adding white. Everyone does it. So you can maybe pop out your models and have a different color palette than the rest of your friends. But pretty simple. You saw the uh, the palette there, you know, just adding more, <laughs> both uh, sunny skin tone and some white into the mixture and building up our previous highlights. You can really see now how much I am just almost like sticking around that main zone or our main uh, highlight point on the skirt here and uh, how very little of the base green you can really see in that area. It's only like little slivers. And uh, again, the paint consistency here, now I'm in the highlights, forgot to mention this. Um, a general rule of thumb is when I get into the brighter highlights into the upper parts, uh, my paint gets thinner. So generally now this paint mixture is at least one to one or uh, one and a half parts water to one part paint. Um, just because as I go up higher in value, I'm painting in, you know, smaller and smaller areas and I'm looking for smaller changes. I'm not looking for big drastic changes. I'm looking for smaller changes in value. And that just helps me um, control our highlighting point. And uh, keeping those highlights small, but still like visible and I can still um, manipulate them well. When you're getting to these really, really uh, high end zone, uh, highlighted zones, sometimes you, you know, just like through the previous, you might need a layer or two. And the flexibility of that is, is that with a bit of the transparency of the paint due to thinning it out, you can gain a lot more control with one single application of value. So your first application might not be super strong, which is fine. And all you do is just go over it again with the exact same mixture and you'll see it get a little bit more saturated and uh, a little bit of a um, opaque color just because, um, you know, when you're adding several layers of transparent paint, you're becoming more opaque and it gets a bit stronger on the model. Sorry, but the, the hand gets in the way a little bit. <laughs> I apologize, but I think you can see um, where I'm going with this, you know, just um, putting out these, like pretty much these max highlights right on the, the edges right there. And again, the largest highlight and the brightest highlight you can see was my, my starting point. And then I take these max highlights here and I'm just applying it very in very small dots around like what I think are the highest folds and uh, the highest little uh, marks in the model there just to bring some of those edges alive and they're just catching just a little bit of light. You know, there's not a lot going on there, but just little bits just give a little more, um, just add that little final touch and emphasis on those areas. All right, so after all this work here, what are we gonna do now to kind of smoothen things out? This is optional, of course, but we're gonna make a glaze. So on our palette here, I'm just grabbing that Misfits green, pinch of black and adding a lot of water. <laughs> so this is pretty thin. This is around like six to six to eight parts water. And what I'm doing here is since we're working with the, a, a, a a shade or a, a shadow color or a shadow glaze, I should say, all of our brush strokes will be going down into the shadows. So I am pretty much riding all of the, the, 
the main uh, shaded areas and then just overlapping a little bit of the highlights careful not to stain not to like have this like completely cover your highlights don't use it like a wash so we're not going to wash the entire model but you can see how i'm just picking out just a little bit of the shadows just on the tips there and pulling downwards again pulling the direction of the brush down into your shadows the other secret here is about when you're using this as a glaze, it is like a wash consistency, but you have to watch out that you're not going to saturate the entire model. So when you pick up a little bit of the, the glaze in your brush uh, and charge your brush, what you should do, what you should get in the habit of, is dabbing off a few areas on a paper towel or on your thumb. If you look at my brush uh, in more detail when it's on to here, You'll see that the brush still goes to a fine tip and all of my and all of the charges contained within the brush. You don't see any excess pooling on the outside of the brush. It's not swole like completely full of water. And the idea here is, is as I'm running my brush across, we really want to grab like we want to make skim coats of this across the model. Now here is me doing the opposite. So what I did is I grabbed the mid tone and I have uh, the, the same amount of, I had to shed warm water in my brush, but I've pretty much made a glaze out of the mid-tone. And you can see the brush direction, I'm going up. So just taking a little bit here and just finding some intermediate areas to see, you know, observing on the area of the model, what could be used a little bit to bring up a little bit of height. This glaze, of course, of this mid-tone paint is pretty soft. It's not as diluted as the shadow. I would say this is around like three, four parts water to one part paint. But um, again, if that's your first time, you know, you could water it down a little bit more and just, you know, take it a little bit slow. And after I do the glaze, I'm just going back with the, the max highlighted again and just reiterate, just retouch anything. Sometimes I just make little mistakes. You know, it always happens. Um, I'd like to say, you know, paintings are just a series of mistakes that we keep fixing. And, um, and of course, also just running over the max highlight to bring in a little bit more. And at this stage, that's what your, uh, that's what the cape or the, the skirt should look like. All right. So the skin here, um, just like we were doing before, is like a base of Misfits Green. But on the palette to the right, I have um, Kislev Flesh and Cadian Flesh. So we're going to be mixing our Misfits Green at the far, first start is with some um, uh, Kislev Flesh to get ourselves a, a lighter green. And we're going to paint the majority of the highlights so like 90 percent of this musculature will be painted in this manner we want to leave do our best to leave um, a little bit of that pure misfits green and a little bit of black in the recesses but you can see i'm just using another number one brush and i'm just kind of like you know slapping it on kind of idea um but uh you know we can always uh, do some corrections and we'll be doing some other um, glazing to correct things later. So mixing in more Kiss Left Flesh now. And start painting on the main musculature volumes. Uh, if you're having a bit of issue on like where exactly where these are placed and just the same thing is, uh, you know, to some degree with the, the skirt, you know, holding it under a lamp, um, especially the nice thing is with this, uh, you know, with Games Workshop's black primer or um, the, this coat of like Misfits Green, it's got a bit of a satin uh, finish to it. So it kind of helps, um, you know, seeing where the light falls under a lamp and you can take a look. But the main point is like on this arm here, the most revealing part is going to be his, um, his, his forearm. So the lower half of the arm and... Uh, uh, on his uh just above his uh, bicep there as well as a little bit more light that's going to be coming in around his shoulder and upper pec um a lot of his uh a lot of his chest and his skin as you can imagine is actually um more in shadow like his hair covers a lot 
the the ornaments are around his his neck cover quite a bit as well as if we can imagine the, the chest is kind of like this big barreled spherical shape um along the sides along the right and the left that's where the curvature of the cylinder curves away from us so that's why generally you don't have a lot of um, light in the armpit or on the sides of uh, on the sides of the body you'll start to go into shadow so that's what we're going to be doing as well on this miniature yeah even though this hand becomes pretty flaming um, I didn't initially know how intense the flame is going to be so I went ahead and safely painted the arm uh, minus the fingers but the main part of the forearm and then his part of his upper arm I painted in the same the, the same skin pattern as we were doing just to be on the safe side you know I could always paint over it later or I didn't exactly know um, what kind of a effect I was going to do for the flaming hand. It was only till later. I just knew about the colors. I was just really focused on like, okay, get these colors down and uh, can, you know, to see how it was all going to play out. And surprisingly, you know, majority of his face is covered again by his cool hair. <laughs> but we do have a few notable um details that we need to just to pick out mainly his forehead and his nose his bridge and a little bit of that right cheek you know just a sliver of it and there's not a lot of space to play on the face but by aiming the light just at the top left just a little bit justified to the right to the left you'll see like i've left a little shadow on the right side it's not big it's not much but it, just a little bit of that will kind of help bring a little more, um, you know, drama to his face and, uh, you know, not a, make it appear so flat. At the end of the day, you know, if you think about all the, like the arms, these arms are just cylinders. So having the highlight run down the center of it, the shoulder is, is another like a ball joint. So we can just make that highlight that as if it were a part of a sphere and then the head it's another big sphere <laughs> but at this stage here you can definitely you know his skin still very much looks green be it with a bit of a uh, orange uh, in orange influence And in a uh, normal fashion, we're just highlighting up. So I'm just adding more of that uh, Kislev flesh into the mix. And continue to highlight up. Similar to when we were painting the skirt, the paint consistency here is around one part water to one part paint. Um, I do notice I've, I've, uh, I've watered the skin down just a little bit more just I found um, uh, the kids left flesh and uh, GW paints you know they're actually you know some of the paints are quite good pigment quite strong so I found that I just wanted to um, thin them out just a little bit more just so they flow a little bit nicer and um, you know I could just uh, when I'm doing these layers if I need to apply a little more strength I find it just easier to do a second layer to um, build a little more opacity if needed. I think even like looking back now uh, at the painting and going through that whole process, I probably could make this, uh, I make paint the make, <laughs> make this paint mixture a little more opaque without thinning it so much. And again just tackling the face see where like since i said that the highlight was on the top left especially on the forehead you got to see my brush strokes pushing up a little bit more pushing up into the left 
and just having the paint the puddle of paint settle closer into the highlight and another thing to be aware of especially when you're doing this is that wet paint always looks brighter than when it's dry so if you're never entirely sure and you're a little bit uncomfortable with that it, it, the easiest thing to do is just go to your brightest highlight point so the start of your volume put a mark down on what your paint is going to be put it down and let it dry take a look make and then you can decide oh how strong this color actually is because uh, there's certain colors out there in like certain paint applications um you know they all look a little bit different when they're wet some paints look, you know, pretty true when they're wet, but not often. Almost all of them look a lot more saturated and brighter when they're wet, but when they dry, they dull down. Um, and that could work, that works to, I think that really works to our advantage. Um, also because like, it's easier to see where your brush strokes are. So you can see where you've painted, where you haven't painted. And then when you dry, when it lets dry, it's probably a um, more often than not, especially when I'm working with more diluted paint, um, it, the the application of the paint itself is softer. So I find it, it makes it much easier to do any blending corrections if I need to do any. If you just, um, if you be very disciplined and are very aware of your um, brush strokes and directions and not rushing, I am a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> I paint a lot every day and, you know, I'm, you know, doing commissions, I'm making content. So yeah, you, you know, sometimes my brush strokes have to be a little bit um, rushed and a little more on demand that way. But, you know, having the luxury of slowing down on certain projects, you know, to really control like each stroke and, you know, emphasis on the direction and your pressure you know you can get through almost an entire miniature for barely any blending at all you can just do it all by the paint application with the brush speed pressure and dilution and then maybe the only thing you need is like you could do a little glaze correction and money i think those are like the some of the best uh, feelings and Throughout this project, I do have some really nice um, paint strokes that I really liked, um, you know, to look into the macro detail of things. And, you know, and so, some some brush strokes are a little bit of a miss, but I mean, that's what, what I said about, you know, painting is just a, a series of fixing corrections. As you can see, I'm going over the same area again, uh, you know, just to um, increase the uh, increase the saturation of that layer, even, you know, because I'm going over it with the the same mix. But um, this will give you a good idea that, you know, layering up several transparent mixes will give you a nice um, soft application. or I should say like softer transitions. There's a really good example where I said where I'm um, placing that a little bit of the light origin on there is where the uh, shoulder, um, pretty much shoulder meets the side of the, the pec. So pretty much kind of like where closer to your collarbone is. And if you're also like, you know, looking for more resources and 
interesting plays of light. I think that's where a really good source to take a look at like a lot of fantasy art or Games Workshop has a ton of really good artwork, especially like codex covers or a big double page spread or, um, you know, even like some portraits of various characters in the Warhammer 40k or like Age of Sigmar range, etc, etc. You know, and taking a look where the artist has placed their lights and how they've created their atmosphere and everything. I think that's always like a very big draw for me. Um, I'm much more into painting what I think feels right rather than trying to always paint in the literal sense on what you see on the model. Like, you know, leather has to be brown. I have to get a brown color, etc, etc. You know, you could still get the feeling of leather, but maybe use uh, more reds, maybe some greens in there, some yellows, you know, to uh, crazy amount of interpretation, you know. And again, it goes back to like, hey, you got to just make it feel believable. It doesn't have to be realistic. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> even just with the realism, it's like, come on, it's a crazy ass elf. Well, elves don't exist. And then you got one that's got a fury hand in the Warhammer 40k universe. None of it makes sense. <laughs> so you can literally just be whatever you want. But again, just, you know, do your best and, and make it believable and bring it from your, you know, from your world and your imagination. Or, uh, you know, draw on some of the inspirations that Games Workshop provides. But in the end of the day, you know, as long as you're having fun with your model, I think that's the most important. And here in the very similar theme of like the, the cloth and stuff, I'm just being very selective on where these like final highlights are really going, you know, just emphasizing, um, especially when you're taking a look at various curves, that's always going to give you a really good clue and indicator on where a highlight's going to go. You can't go too wrong to try to find in curves, find the apex of a curve. So the apex would be the highest point in the curvature and start placing a light there. Chances are not like it'll look pretty good, even if you, you know, you find yourself you're not very good at reading volumes, you know, just looking for curves and finding a place to plate, you know, to put the light at the apex and just have, um, you know, everything decay from there. Yeah, some of these, uh, some of these highlights I place in the face, I really like how I'm building it up. See, I'm just really focusing on the very top of this forehead now. Oh, getting more base misfits green. I think you should know what I'm preparing on this palette right now. Just added a little bit of uh, Kislev flesh into that mix. But yeah, I'm creating a glaze. keep adding water i think the one of the most important things especially when it comes to the face and like skin when you're doing these glazes is keep this extra thin i would th i would go thinner than rather than thicker to play on the safe side because you know you can always make you can always put more layers and you can always increase the um you can always decrease the dilution it doesn't really work the other way around. <laughs> if you go too thick, then you got to rebuild the, you know, and you, if you made the area too dark or, you know, completely like stained all your highlights, you got to go back. But if you go really, really thin, you can always apply more layers and then gradually find the sweet spot. That's a part of the part with like the process and the discovery of it when you're doing this method. And then uh, you, you can always make some mental notes while you're painting an area or, you know, like I said, you know, we're painting the front of this miniature right now, but when it comes to the back, you know, I'll have a good key idea on, you know, exact or the better idea of the dilution that I will need. Or maybe you might even have to modify the area. But if you notice, just like how we were glazing on the, um, on, on the skirt, you know, 
um, keeping your charge very, very small in the brush. You're not flooding the area and you're really looking for a thin application and skim coating the area. You know, no big blobs. We're not washing the entire model. And after when your glaze is dry, uh, I do, you know, I skip the hair dryer sections in here. I'm not going to, you know, guys watching here, this, bzz, you know, going across on the screen, but I do have a hair dryer at my desk. So, you know, just to, to speed the process up a little bit after I glaze, I just hit it with a little hair dryer action just to get that area dry. And now I'm doing the opposite. So I've made a glaze with our upper highlight, not our max highlight, um, just with uh, something a little bit less. And I'm just glazing over the highlight sections as well. Again, um, you know, making sure that I'm just hitting the highlights and the midtones, not pulling this highlight glaze into the shadows. You know, complete opposite, going up. So, and you can also even use this highlight glaze to tint shadows to make them just a little bit brighter, which I'm doing here in the armpit, you know. Um, it, it's, a, it's just another tool as I'm thinking that, especially during this process, I was like, oh, you know what? It's a little too dark there. Let's bring a little bit more light just to give a little more um, presence to his body. And, uh, you know, it's just a creative choice that I want to do. And, um, yeah. I just applied it there. But you can see how that glaze acts and looks differently when it goes over the darker area and vice versa. Here I've actually made the glaze a little bit uh, thicker instead of uh, six parts water to one part paint. This one is closer to, uh, again, three to four. Actually, I did the same uh, dilution kind of idea on the skirt than I did, I did with the skin. And finally, nice little extra touch, brightest highlight on the head. All right, with the hair, now we're gonna take black and uh, highlight it with samurai green. So another variation of the, the green palette, and this time just with the hair. We still want the hair to be, the idea is to have a pretty black hair but to have like a touch of green and then near the end we're gonna have like a, a touch of uh of sunny skin tone in the hair just to give a little more reflection with white but predominantly it's supposed to be a fairly very desaturated very dark hair but the thing interesting thing with hair and to paint it is um depending how much he showers and conditions uh, hair is actually quite naturally shiny. Um, a really cool resource to take a look at how to illustrate hair is also um, a simplified version is how comic books um, illustrate hair or like manga um, because they actually make the hair look pretty shiny. So the light points I'm going to be placing on the head, the main head like light is going to be at the top of the head, the top of the crown idea and but then we're just also going to separate each little uh, we're going to separate some strands with the horizontal bands of shadows so there's going to be like it's going to be like a highlight at the very top the highlight's going to curl down and then in the midpoint so pretty much when where the hair goes vertical um we're going to separate with a shadow and then we're going to bring some highlight back in again. That'll just give our, our hair that still that dark appearance, um, but it's still highlighted. Um, that can happen because if we were to paint all the highlights through the entire length, the strand of the hair, his hair would not really be black anymore. It would start turning a lot lighter and gray. Um, the similar idea is, is that think of instead of the individual strands, you want to paint we're painting the entire body of hair and if we follow our previous rule of following apexes of curves give you a really good idea of it so the biggest apex curve is at the top of his head and then as a curl and then it goes downwards goes a little bit straight and then it curls to the left as you can see and then that 
curvature that's springing to that's going to the left that's another you know apex so we can bring the highlight back the same thing on the top knot if you take a look at the very top of the knot there's a highlight there and then as it curves down to the left you see some shadow i put some more shadow area in there and then the highlight comes back on the curvature near the tips With some of the hairs, of course, with a few strands, we will ride an edge highlight that's mostly the most forward facing. So in the very, very front, just to, um, you know, show off that, that line and a few strands, but I'm more looking at like the, the body of hair as a whole, and you can start to see where I'm, how I place these lights. And, uh, I think from the, of course, from the finished, um, image that you've seen, and see how that's all done but again you nothing super fancy here we're just going to um go layer up and go from dark and just go to you know fairly light which we'll be doing also like another thing to um you know to uh, be aware of with your brush is uh definitely like it's going to be your you know your charge so you're not really blobbing into every single recess but as we get up into higher highlights we will start to separate the hairs more so at the first several stages of highlight you didn't really see me um, start separating any of the individual hair sculpts very much but now as we get to the upper highlights, that's where I start separating them more and more. Um, if you start separating them from the very, very beginning, I don't I think it just looks looks awkward. The volume doesn't look uh, very correct and his hair looks um, very thin. I think he's got a full head of hair. I don't think he's like balding or thinning anytime soon. But yeah, you know, um, especially for this, this is where you might want to have your paint just a little bit thicker. The thinner paint was great, um, especially, you know, on the larger body volumes, like on the, on the skirt and the skin. But when it comes to these thinner volumes here, like they're almost like all these hairs are almost just a bunch of like um, edge highlights. And it can be quite tricky to paint uh, edge highlights with really diluted paint. It's possible, of course, I'm not going to say it's impossible, just but for the ease of, you know, getting this project through as well as like for like if you're going to paint a squad of these, you know, we want to make it a little more, a little more um, unit friendly. You can kind of see how my paint got a little too diluted that I didn't control it very well at the very, very top of the crown. You can see how like some of the paint got wet and went in the recess there. And uh, I'll probably have to go over that area again with another layer just to gain the same opacity and strength as the other stages of the hair that we're on. But that's something just to be aware of, just to let you know. And here we go. So instead of getting, of course, we're not going to go to pure um, samurai green. But way before we get to there, I start adding some sunny skin tone into um, into the mix to gain our next highlight. Uh, again, you know, just to keep a little bit more color in the works, as well as since the majority of our painting here has like sunny skin tone in it, that just kind of gives us a little bit of a unified um, highlight temperature of the light. So we have like all this green in the shadows to give ourselves, um, you know, what our, our shadows are looking like. Um, and, and have that color unified the piece that way. And then we can also unify the piece further by, you know, sharing a highlight color and adding a little bit of that into pretty much everything in the piece. There are elements in this uh, on this model in the tutorial that i don't cover just there i painted them very simply and um or i didn't think it just really warrant a tutorial on those because there weren't key aspects but um the, the little 
pieces of bone that is keeping his taut knot up. He's got like a kind of like this hand and the, the one piece of rope. Um, those elements are actually just um, <laughs> Rhinox hide and uh, mixed in with more sunny skin tone. If you want to know those colors, just those two and and uh, just highlighting it that way. Very similar method. But again, try not to keep, uh, you know, too much color in there. I think the Rhinox hide actually mixed in just a bit of black just to um, uh, kill some of the kill some of the richness that Rhinox hide has just to lower it down a little bit more. But other than that, it's pretty much pretty much what I said. You can definitely see with like the highlights again, just getting smaller and smaller. And this is a better image and there's a better idea what I'm talking about where I said, you know, the top of the head is the main highlight and as it comes, the hair starts to come down, you see a, a break. So you can see there's more of the shadow color and then uh, more light comes back on the tip on the, you know, the upswing of, of the curve and uh, the apex on that, on that part of the hair. And the same thing on this top knot. They've just bundled that highlight right at the top of the top knot. So light, shadow, light, shadow. You get like pauses. And you know, that that's part of the the idea, even I was talking about at the beginning in the introduction, how we said that each major point of light has breaks in them. So, you know, not all the lights are fusing together and making one giant one. We need uh, we need pauses in there. You need a little bit of light, then some shadow, then some light again, and well, essentially that's also the definition of contrast too. So contrast and interest. You know, you need a you need shadows just as much as light in a in a painting for it, for I think it for it to work and to um, be you know be more interesting. Here these final highlights, especially on the top of the crown. Now I'm really starting to pick off each individual um, molded part of the hair on these max highlights. I quite like that highlight actually, that, that little fork that's right by his uh, nose and eye there. I think that's kind of interesting. You know, a little interesting intersection. You can start to see some lines cross each other. It creates a little bit of tension. And uh, I just chose to show that off a little bit more. Again, making those highlights small, just focusing on those areas. You can just imagine, you know, if you just ran, you know, an edge highlight all through the entire edge of every single strand, um, you know, I think you'd be pretty much like a, a grayed out senior citizen. <laughs> but here, you know, I particularly like it anyway. the charm right so more glazing so again just picking off uh just getting a little of our, our base uh you know our base uh shadow mix this time like i did add a little bit i'm glazing with 
um, black and misfits green again even though we didn't do any misfits green um, within the hair initially now I'm adding a little bit in the glazes and again focusing more on the transition into shadow so the mid-tone of the hair and into shadow um, there are going to be you know on the top knot is you know there I got a little bit on the highlights which is fine you know but I'm more using this now this glaze as a unifier so smoothing everything out and then um, to give a little more detail and separation into the hair I'm just taking a fine paint a fine uh, brush double zero just with uh, black just with a touch of misfits green and just carving in a few lines just to give a few um, hair separations in there um, the main ad the main goal here is just adding a little more contrast into the work into the into the hair give it a little more character because i was you know noticing that oh i've been painting a bit loose let's uh let's get let's tighten up the hair just a little bit and just make a few extra strands especially around the the head and the face area this is a extremely helpful doing a very very thin black line that outlines the skin to the hair so they don't feel like they're kind of merging together otherwise after that you can always do a little touch-ups with some final highlights if you've made any mistakes all right so the osl flame the fun part about the hand the initial mix here that we're mixing on the palette and this is over a white so you first want to base coat the entire hand uh, the entire flame section white you probably will need a couple of coats to get this fairly opaque this is worth taking a little bit extra time on just to make sure that white is pretty solidly on there because applying this light color on top of the white will definitely really punch out the the color and the, the vibrancy that we need the mixture that i'm doing here right now is with Wild Rider Red mixed with um, Sunny Skin Tone. I think it's around two parts Sunny Skin Tone to one part Wild Rider Red and just with a pinch of white. Um, so I lost the footage on there. I forgot to hit record on my palette right where I started. But you can kind of see the difference here. So after I coat the highlighted area, now I'm just using uh, pure um, wild wild rider red and for the highlighting of this, this is actually going in the opposite direction so we want the fire to be brightest in the middle and it starts cooling off as it gets further away from the central part of we could say like his palm or his fist that's where it's like I can imagine where the the, the hottest part is the source is so as we get um, dark, as we get going through the values, we're actually going darker rather than lighter at this stage. And we are looking to paint in the shades that are the raised areas. So one, we want to leave the inner parts warmer or hotter, as well as we also want to, um, make uh, the further um, the licks of flame that are you know um, that are licking away from his palm to be darker so that means that's where we're going to be painting on our shadows feels funny when we're painting shadows but initially we would mostly paint these areas in highlight if it was any other subject now mixing in with the wild rider red we put in evil sun scarlet man they make the red paints all with these tongue twisters <laughs> but oh well games workshop names but hell they're good paint um and so yeah again we're going to be going back on the stages here and just looking for our raised areas the other secret for that is like the first few stages first the initial stages that i was applying earlier i would kind of put on the paint a little bit thicker to make to help make the lines a little bit wider but now you know as we start moving darker um we need to try to 
uh, do our best to uh, respect the previous boundary, just like what we're doing with highlighting. But again, you know, with our paint mixture, um, you know, I put this at around um, almost one to one water to paint, a little bit less. So this would be like maybe 40, 60 or uh, 30, 70 around there. Um, you know, just to keep our marks a little bit, a uh, little bit softer, more diluted. And again, you know, depending on the, the finer mixture that we have, as well as the size of brush you have, hence the amount of moisture that's in there, um, you know, you might need a second layer just to find that, uh, just to find that layer a little bit opaque and to get the, uh, the coverage that you want. But again, you know, just take your time. I think this is the part of the miniature that's really going to pop. So, you know, if there's any place to uh, spend a little bit extra time on, I think it's on the Flaming Fist. I think that's definitely an eye catcher. Um, I treat the fingers as just, you know, I cool them down. I think they just look cooler like that. Huh? <laughs> really bad joke. Um, but yeah, as we get further and further along in some of the flames there might be a little bit of an interesting curve so there's like you know two different sides uh, to them so there's an upwards facing edge and a downwards facing edge you know you can take a little bit of creative liberty but just bear in mind in general you know the inside of the palm and in the recesses it's lighter and it gets darker as it goes uh, more outwards and uh, and you, you should be fine. Now I've started to mix a little bit of black in with the mix to get the darker tones. When you're mixing this on the palette, if you saw me how I didn't just didn't grab black and just put it directly into the mix um, and I put some of the black on the side just before going in mixing into there. That's just to, um, you know, make sure I'm just grabbing a little bit of black because especially on this, you know, these strong values of red, it'll corrupt it really quick. And then you end up uh, having a really big mess on your palette with a big blob of red that's way too dark. And trying to add more red back into it, uh, It'll take a lot of red to go to, you know, get it back and you'll never really completely get it back to the the previous or the pure red of like Wild Rider or Evil Sun Scarlet because there's a little bit of black in the corruption. So, you know, um, when making this when making this mix into to the shadow, these darker colors, just be a little bit extra mindful and careful on the palette so you avoid this complete mess of of color on your palette and then you know half your palette is just devoted to this red <laughs> trust me i've learned this in the past where you're like oh. and then you just you gotta quit while you're ahead <laughs> and then just start another uh, color mix on the palette there instead of uh, burning yourself on the one that you screwed up on but again it's very similar uh theme in terms of brush direction you know, always pushing my brush towards the home color of whatever I'm painting. So since I'm painting these shadows, you know, they're going outwards, you know, going uh, towards the darker area of there. There's a good example. See how there's like those several ticks of black on the right. That's me removing some of the charge of the black. And then I can always bring a little bit of black in if I need to. So I can just control the mix on the palette better and not uh, be swimming in this big ugly mess and to get these uh to get these uh you know those really high edges on there we can it's always advantageous to you know try turning our brush way to the side so we can just really use the side part of the brush uh side part of the bristles to really just catch the very fine edges onto there and even though we're painting in shadow i'm kind of treating it as highlight so these last few applications of this shadow i've actually diluted it again a little bit more than the first few base coats just so i have a little more control in the shading 
uh, to really, uh, you know, get that, get a nice, uh, get a nice um, transition going on. I think pretty much the last part here is, yeah, this is almost like pure black now. So it's got a little bit of, uh, it's got a bit of evil sun scarlet. Ugh, I'm getting these two mixed up. That's what I hate with paint names sometimes. I can't remember which one is uh, the higher value, which one's the darker value. I think you get what I mean. All right, so, you know, clean up some of those transitions. So I just grabbed our uh, Wild Rider Red, just made a glaze, and I'm gonna apply this glaze. But the other bonus part of this glaze is, yeah, I'm gonna apply it over the, the flaming hand, but as if you notice my first, the first stroke that I put on there, I put it on top of the skin on the arm. So we can also start using this glaze to start tinting highlights that are adjacent to the flaming hand and to give a bit of an OSL effect. So even on the hair, since the hair is, uh, you know, the highlights are done very, very light, this glaze really grabs into those highlights very well and, and will tint them quite nicely. Um, same thing on the skin. We can tint the skin with this color, which, of course, I think makes perfect sense. His hand is on fire. And you can see me even glazing some of the um, secondary uh, little ornaments. You know, that skull and that know, decayed hand or whatever is hanging from his, <laughs> his neck. And, of course, um, to give even more emphasis to brighten this up now i've mixed i've added white into the 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 first primary mix of our um, wild rider red and sunny skin tone and added a lot of white into there so now we can just place this into the um uh the, the crevices that are closest to the palm of the hand it also make a. It also helps a little bit if you water this down just a little bit, so the paint actually like flows into some into these cracks, into these details. I think it's also handy to get that in there, so it just flows a little bit, and uh, you really start to see the the contrast that's really starting to happen now, and uh, making this thing glow quite quite bright. And uh, the details for the eyes are exactly like the hand, be it we skip some steps just because there's almost like no room. So just by dotting the eye white in, in the area and then just filling it with, the, with our highlight mix will uh, get us the eye. There's only like one eye showing. Well, the other one is, but I'll just make it just one eye. <laughs> I think it looks kind of cooler that way. And I don't have to shove my brush into that really, really deep recess. As well as uh, the same glaze that I was hitting the hair and such, I will hit uh, on the on on the green skirt on those highlights there. If you notice, I don't make the OSL um, super intense in terms of affecting everything else. You know, I, yeah, there's always like a time and a place for that, but. I really wanted to show more of the color that's playing between the orange and the green rather than just having it overwhelmingly orange. But with that tutorial, that is it for the Dark Elder Mandrake. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial series um, and uh, you got to see a little bit of play with color and you know how to position lights a little bit more creatively rather than you know, just attacking it with a, a zenithal highlight. You know, pick a few elements on the model that you find really interesting and, you know, illuminate them a little bit more. I think that's always a little bit interesting and, you know, depending on the, the painter, um, you can always see a little bit of their taste on what they think feels cool or, you know, what they want to uh, convey out of a miniature, even though, you know, 
a, a lot of people are pretty much painting the the same sculpt so i think there's a lot of creativity we have there and you know have fun try to find a a color or two that maybe you have in your collection that you really like or you know hell if you really like this uh if you really like, like that samurai green go for it it's from chimera colors um uh but other than that thanks again for joining me and uh we'll see you in the next one happy painting <laughs>